Here we go. Okay. I'm here with Manny Villafana, living legend of medicine, a.k.a. just a kid from the Bronx, Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx. Manny, it's a pleasure to be sitting down with you here it's again always. today. And uh, we're a far away from, uh, from your hometown here in Barcelona, <laughs> but it's great to have you here. Well, great. Thank you. So, Manny, let's, uh, we just got off a panel and uh, had a great response, a lot of fun in that conversation. I want to start with a sort of a similar theme, and that's let's talk a little bit about um, let's talk a little bit about Medical 21. You've got seven IPOs in your history, hundreds of billions of dollars in shareholder value created through all of those companies, millions of patients' lives touched and saved, and we can get to that towards the end of this. But I want to talk first a little bit about what you're doing today with Medical 21. So can you get us current on that? Okay. Well, the project that we're presently working on is the development of an artificial artery for bypass surgery. Today, there are between 800,000 and a million patients annually being operated on to solve pain in the chest, which is the result of ischemic conditions on the heart. To do that, patients have to submit their body, and I literally mean submit their body to the blade of a surgeon, scalpel of the surgeon, who will have to open up your legs, who will also open, have, open up the breast, the connection of the breast to arteries, okay? They will also, in 23% of the patient, also have to open up your arms. This results not only in scarring and, and infection and a lot, a lot of pain, uh, and it's got to be a way of eliminating that. Being approached by the University of Iowa, some of their scientists were working on a material and they came and called me and said, Manny, why don't you come down and take a look at what we're doing? Well, I went down with a couple of our people that I work with and they took a look and they were working on a material that we felt was very interesting. And I know that over the last 50, 60 years, people have tried to eliminate the harvesting of these vessels and doing all of this uh, radical surgery of harvesting these vessels, for the last 50, 60 years, people have tried to work on an artificial artery. I saw the material. I saw what they were going, to, you know, what they were doing, and I said, other people are going to be interested in this, and unfortunately, they're going to try to do it the same way as, as they've been trying to do it for the last 50, 60 years. I looked and I said, can I have that material? And they said, yes, of course. And we signed a little agreement with the university in, of which we ended up with a, uh, the use of this material. We have a license for it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's interesting that there were two other companies that were there trying to secure the same material. And in fact, they were there before I was there. And when they... Uh, when it was assigned to me, to Medical 21, the two people said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we were here before Manny. And the head of the uh, research uh, group that handles all of these uh, patents and things like that at the university said, yeah, but you're not Manny. And they knew that if I grab on something, I will try my best and we'll go after it. So we started with that and we started with the approach can we make an artificial artery to eliminate the harvesting of vessels? Well, after a long, long time of seven years in which we've had uh, 14 iterations, that is to say, you know, you tried one, nah, no good, try it again, no, no good. And every time you do that, that's another iteration. You almost have to start from scratch. You have to start your animal work again, and you have to do a whole bunch of different things. But after 14 iterations, we finally reached a point where we're ready to go into humans. What it will mean is that we can take out of a package rather than an hour or two hours long, I'm just opening one leg. We can take out of a package 
instead of taking off the breasts of a man or a woman, a vessel that causes terrific pain, okay? Or what's even the one that's amazing to me is that we can take it out of the package and eliminate for those 23% of the patients their arm being torn open. We use our arms so much, okay? And many times the resulting, not only the scarring and the pain, but they often lose the feelings in their fingertips. There was once a very major, major uh, lawsuit in which they operated it like that on a, a world-renowned violinist who lost his career because he could no longer feel the fingertips. Anyway, can we do this? I think we can, and I'm pleased to say that we hope that within the next three or four months, we'll be able to start our clinical trials on humans uh, in Switzerland. So Manny, um, <clears throat> you got seven IPOs, some blockbuster deals in there, ATS, St. Jude, CPI. How do, you, how do you rank this opportunity? It's, uh, how, does it, how does it fare in that class of mega deals? Well, I know people don't believe me on this one, but those were cakewalks. Those <laughs> were teeny weeny compared to what we're doing. How do you do that, man? How do you, how do you calculate that? Well, when we started CPI, there was about maybe 60, 70,000 pacemakers per year being implanted throughout the world with seven manufacturers, by the way. When we started St. Jude, at that time, the world market for heart valves was 65,000 heart valves, of which there was also about six or seven manufacturers pursuing that market. Well, this market, we estimate, conservatively, and only for the heart, is between two and a half and three and a half million grass being used. I don't know about you, my math says that that should be 50 times the size of St. Jude. Now, how it all comes out after 10, 15, 20 years, I really don't know. But I can tell you we're starting out from a much, much, much higher minimum level than we ever did before. Furthermore, the price of what we're selling these things are at least three or four times higher than what we were selling heart valves for. That's incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. When you, when you start looking at those yeah. numbers, it really is staggering. And the fact that you characterize St. Jude's acquisition by Abbott for $30 billion? $30 billion. $30 billion, and you, you characterize that as a cakewalk? That That's a cakewalk. That tells me a lot yeah. About, yeah. About, your, about your attitude. Right. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit into that mm -hmm. because, Manny, you've, been, you've seen it all. You've uh, built multiple companies. You've seen multiple cycles. Even with your track record, it's still difficult to go out and raise money in not only the current climate, but in any climate. I think you would attest to the fact that it's, 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 it's difficult to raise it's capital. So yes. let's talk about that. What has changed? What hasn't changed? And, uh, you know, I mean, tell us about the, the climate out there for raising capital, for, for scrapping entrepreneurs. Well, you know, there's the market, obviously, over the years, and I've been doing this for the last 45, 50 years, has changed completely. First and foremost, there are many, many, many more competitors because there are many, many more products, okay? And they're all vying for the same products. Um, today, like I said, we did a pacemaker, okay? Uh, today, the technology that we developed is being used by all the manufacturers of pacemakers, the exact same technology, okay? They all make their pacemakers basically the same, okay? and they're all fighting for that market. And that market today is in the neighborhood of four to five billion dollars, okay? So everybody's busy doing that. We did heart valves, okay? And today, again, that heart valve market has grown with many other manufacturers of heart valves, okay? And that market is somewhere in the neighborhood of about six billion dollars, but they're all fighting for that, okay? Uh, we have grown in which we see these companies are so big now that it's hard to put your arms around them. So an executive, especially the chief executive of a, one of these companies, has to determine 
Where are we going to put our resources? We're fighting tooth and, you know, I would say tooth and nail with a variety of other competitors that they can't even look at a new technology because we don't have the time, we don't have the resources, we don't have the manpower to really go after these things. So the young entrepreneur who may have the greatest things in sliced bread, okay, is saying, how do I get the attention of the people who have to make those very, very difficult decisions? Then on top of all of that is the fact that looking at a new product, developing a new product, has to encounter a most difficult regulatory environment, uh, an environment much bigger, much more complex than ever before. You add that all up, and it makes a very, very tough road to, to go up, to try to get things started. Now, I've taken a different approach, which has helped me, but again, I still have to go on that very tough road. I, I have the advantage that I can start on that road working with individuals that have made money from some of the things we've done in the past. Okay, Manny, what are we doing now? Now we're going to do this. We're going to make an artificial graph. Okay, I have no idea what the hell that is, but let's give it a try. Are you doing it? Yeah, I'm doing it. I say, okay, fine. Let's start off with some money. And that will take us and give us a little bit of a start. Okay, it's like putting gasoline in the engine for the first tank. But if you're going to take a long road of seven years, you're going to have many tanks of gasoline that you're going to have to get. Okay? Um, so we do that. Okay? We have the advantage that we know the doctors. What doctor is going to do that? Are you kidding me? I walk into an OR. I walk into the office of a chief of cardiac surgery. Uh, I knock on the door and I open the door. And they don't even say, hi, Manny. How's the family? How's the girls? And stuff like that. No. The first thing they say, now what are we doing? Okay? So I have those advantages. But yet, at the end of the day, the travel road is much longer than before. Okay? It's much more complex. And, and, and to get anyone's attention is very difficult. Top that on the fact that no one has ever, ever developed an artificial small diameter coronary artery. And so many people have tried that when I finally get to the executive, to the decision makers, they say, Manny, what are you talking about? We've all have tried to make an artificial graph and tell us how the, a little Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx is going to do it when all the major players have tried. And I have to tell them, yeah, but I'm doing it. It's a great message for other entrepreneurs are out there that, that are out there that may be working on their first venture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I guess the question that comes up a lot, and I've asked you this before, but I think it's worth sharing is, you know, um, why, are, why are you at it again? Is it because you see the opportunity in this venture or is it just in your DNA that you have to do it? And, <laughs> you know, for some of those other entrepreneurs that are working on their first one, we want to see them get that success so that yeah. they can hopefully catch the bug. But tell us why you're not out golfing. Is it because the opportunity is <laughs> so big? Is it because it's just, it's just who you are? Talk about that a little bit. All right, since you brought it up, the golfing, I got to tell you this story. <laughs> Okay, I was trying to raise some money and a young MBA uh, individual who had just graduated from Harvard, he had his MBA, young guy, and I was trying to, to raise some money. He turns around to me and he says, why aren't you playing golf? And I said to him, let me tell you something. I, I was in Spain. In fact, look at it. here we are in Spain. And I was in Spain, in Madrid, Spain, and I was in the, with some surgeons, and they were all talking about, we're going to do a heart transplant this weekend. And, and I said, really? Guys, I've never been in a heart transplant. Any chance I might attend? And they said, sure. Are you going to be here this weekend? I said, yes, of course. And he said, well, we'll do one either Friday or Saturday. And I said, wait a minute. How do you know you're going to do that? So he took me to a window, opened up this big window overlooking a little plaza in, in Madrid. And there was all you could see with these motorcycles, these mopeds, and no one was wearing a helmet. And he said, and if you think this is bad, you should see it on the weekends. We will have a heart transplant this weekend. So sure enough, I don't remember if it was Friday night or Saturday night, 
they called me up at, the, at my hotel. Hello. Uh, Senor Villafania, come on down. Okay, yeah, I'll be right down. So I jumped down and went to the hospital. I, I gowned up and the whole thing. I went into the OR. And they told me to stand right at the head of the, of the, of the table where the patient's head is and, and just stand there and watch. And you could take a look over the curtain and you could see the opening of the chest and, you know, working with that. And they had a little table right, right, right next to me with a the little green uh, towel on it. All of a sudden, this guy, pow, comes walking in, has a face mask on. And uh, not even wearing a face mask, but a towel just on his face, carrying a little igloo, a little Coca-Cola stand, okay? And, and he's, buenos, buenas noches, senores. And he pulls out a frozen heart. It wasn't frozen. It was cold because it was a little igloo with ice at the bottom. And it was in a plain, simple sandwich bag, a little Ziploc bag. I said that was, huh? This is a guy's heart, and it's in a Ziploc bag. Okay? So they took it out and they checked some numbers or whatever, the proper number, and then they put that heart right on that little table next to me. All right, let's go. And so they start taking out the other guy's heart. Click, 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 and all. And then they pull the other guy's heart out and they put it on the same table right next to the new heart. And the old heart was still beating. Ba-doom, ba-doom, ba-doom. But it was going a little bit slower, ba-doom. So then they, they cut the labels off the new heart and they start sewing it in. But in the meantime, ba-doom, ba-doom, ba-doom. It was still going, the heart going a little bit slower and a little bit slower. Finally, after a few minutes, they take some clamps off and all of a sudden blood is going into the new heart and it starts to beat. But that very moment that it started to beat, the first heart, the old heart, stopped. Right. And it was like life went from the old heart into the new heart. And at that very moment, I said to the kid, when golfing is as exciting as that, <laughs> maybe I'll take it. <laughs> And it's my life. I, I love what we do. We create things for people that need it, okay? We create jobs. We create a lot of different things. Uh, for some of my investors, they, they've had an opportunity. In fact, at this meeting, somebody said, thank you for the four education, university educations of my children and two marriages. You paid for all of them, meaning he's one of my old investors, okay? okay? And, and we do other things. Our family, we're, we're not very wealthy. We give a lot of our money away. And, you know, that's what we do. And, and like I said, no matter what you're doing, it can't be as exciting as, as my life. I, I've had an exciting life. I've been blessed with wonderful family, wonderful wife and children. I, I can't complain at all. That's amazing. I love that. Manny, um, you, you've been to every conference in the world. You've bought every market research report. You've hired every consultant that there is with, your, with uh, everything that you've done over the last many years. Why do you come to LSI? Besides the fact that we're good friends, why do you come to LSI? <laughs> well, you know, it, it is amazing. As I was saying at this morning's uh, conference, I said, look, before anything else, guys, let's take a moment to, to, to thank Scott and his staff for creating a possibility, an agenda that allows us entrepreneurs to be able to present our wares and what we're doing to a group of people who are looking for the opportunity to take the money that they have from investors and put it into projects that hopefully will have a fine return. It isn't easy to get all these people together and put that together and get Scott because he has a good program, will be able to do that. And that's why we're here, all right? I hope that many of you will meet the opportunity of having met someone that has the funds, and by the same token, the funds which are in the form of a capitalist, a, a venture capital, uh, equity capital, and strategics can find opportunities amongst the, the high technology that's being 
uh, display today. I mean, this meeting in particular, I've sat around and listened to a lot of new, new technologies, and uh, you can't find that easily. You can't. So this is why we come to LSI. Uh, not to mention, I don't know how he does it, but he always has the best venue. <laughs> okay? I don't know. I mean, you come here and you say, I don't have to go on vacation for another two years, five years, because his, his venues are such that you're working and yet you feel you're on vacation. You're too kind. Thank you, Manny. Um, you know, you're known, Manny, as uh, one of the legends, not only just in medicine, but you're a legendary networker. In fact, I've shared with my friends that you can't walk down the streets of Minneapolis without somebody saying, hey, Manny, or going somewhere, somewhere where somebody knows who you are. Um, I'm just curious because you are that legendary networker. What types of people have you met while you're here? You kind of touched on it, but are you meeting with family offices, strategic? Who, who is it that you're meeting with when you come to an LSI event? Well, in our present situation at Medical 21, uh, we're at the point now where we're taking a whole new step. We're going into a clinical trials. Okay, uh, to do a trial, it requires uh, a fairly large sum of money. We want to raise somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 million. Well, when you've been doing this for seven years, it's hard to go keep going back to your original shareholders for more money and more money. So it's time to begin talking to big guys. Now, typically, your, your uh, strategics are companies that will probably look at a company once it has 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars in sales. Well, I'm, I'm still far away from that, okay? But on the other hand, we have what I believe is the single largest product ever developed for it to be implanted. That is a jewel, that's a big jewel. So what I'm trying to do is get in front of some strategics, that's large companies, and they're gonna say, Manny, come back when you're 30 or 40 or 50 million. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's take a look at this first before you let me, throw me out the door. This is the largest, bigger than anything you're handling. If I put this on the table, there's gonna be several other companies looking at that same jewel that I put on the table. Now, why don't you guys just Think about it and say, we have a chance to get involved with Manny on the single biggest product. Are you interested? If you are, why? You don't have to buy us out. Just do a little bit of transforming some money that I need right now to do this study. Take your time in properly evaluating what we're doing. And if you're, you know, if you're interested, you already got your, your nose under the tent, as they say. Okay? You're already on this side of the fence. Okay, but if you're not interested, the little money that you put in the company will be in our stock, and I can guarantee you, we're going to make a lot of money. So either way, you're going to gain. And that's what I'm trying to do, is to get some strategics earlier than normal to take a look at us. Okay? That's what we're doing. So uh, we've talked a lot about the business, and um, we haven't talked a lot about the fun stories. Um, you were talking earlier about, you know, that, that young kid from the, Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx and where it all began and some articles uh, in the newspaper that you think fondly of. Why don't you share us a story about that, that article you were talking to me about in the elevator? Okay. The, uh, you you got to understand that I was born in the South Bronx in an area that was considered the, uh, the poorest congressional district of our country. Uh, I was born and lived in the South Bronx. Uh, I was born in 1940. And uh, around 1949, uh, 1948, 1949, uh, I started going to, uh, to a boys club. Because in the South Bronx, there was nothing. Uh, in fact, uh, on the front page of the New York Times, uh, not the inside the New York Times, on the front page of the New York Times, they did a story about my neighborhood, Mount Haven uh, District, and, and in particular, the street East 139th Street. I lived on East 139th Street. And they showed in that article 
the street, and they showed where all the drug houses were. They talked about the crime rate, the murder rate, the prostitution rate, a variety of different things, <clears throat> okay? And it was so bad that they named the article Life at the Bottom. That's where I came from. I unfortunately did not have the opportunity to go to uh, finer, uh, higher education, I should say, because I was fortunate enough, however, to be living next door to a small little Catholic grammar school. Um, it was so overcrowded that uh, the sisters, the nuns, would have classes that were 62 children per class twice a day. Okay, they had, in other words, each nun was responsible for about 124 kids, okay? Uh, then I was fortunate enough that at, at high school, I went to a Catholic high school called Cardinal Hayes High School, which in my opinion, still today, is probably one of the finest high schools in the country. I had that privilege, I had that opportunity. Unfortunately, I couldn't go any further than that because there was just no money in our home, okay? Um, my brothers and my father uh, had left home. It was just mom and I, uh, and she was unfortunately a, 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 a woman with a, a very limited Spanish education of third grade, so she was a seamstress in a sweatshop. Uh, and my father uh, did not know how to read or write. He would sign with an X, and in spite of the fact that I would grab his hand and try to teach him how to sign his name. So we... So that's where I grew up. And uh, so I had a fend for myself. I, I joined a boys club because a friend of mine do it. And I was always looking for work. I started working at nine, nine years old, hanging coats and uh, at the boys club and had little odd jobs within the club, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and then from there is I started eventually going my first real, real job was joining a company called Radio Engineering Labs, uh, which was in Long Island City uh, in the Queens. That was my first real job, but that's where I started learning my education uh, in electronics and reading and a variety of different things. And I didn't realize till years later that uh, the good Lord gave me a brain in which I could read and it would stay in there. It wouldn't come out the other ear, you know? Mm -hmm. It would, would kind of stay in there and uh, uh, ended up with a pretty decent education that way by learning it on the outside. Wow. From life at the bottom to beating the odds and being here <laughs> upon the 40th floor of the Hotel Arts in Barcelona, so, I'd, right. I'd say it's been quite a, yeah, quite quite a, a run. Few, right. And uh, like we, we talk about, you're not done yet. and we're, yeah. we're rooting for you. You're such an asset to our industry, Manny, and you're an asset to mankind. All the things that you've done to help the world and to help our industry are just just amazing and it's it's a privilege and an honor to be able to share those stories with you and uh, eager to watch anxious to watch you run through this next one let's go back to a little business stuff before we wind this thing down uh, you said you're raising 10 million now entering human trials how far does the once you close the 10 million which we're sure you'll get to how far does it get you does it get you all the way through the human trials or what's next yeah, afterwards well, what's 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 happening in our plans um, is that we hope to raise this money to be able to do this uh, study. Um, and we have already had indication from a couple of firms that say, Manny, we can do an IPO, initial public offering, uh, with your clinicals. Okay, if you got clinicals and you have patients and you're having success, we, we can do an IPO. In which case, we're probably talking about somewhere between 50 or $100 million IPO. Um, and that would take us through. But simultaneously, as I said, and uh, I'm touching base with some strategics to see if they have some early interests. Um, and, and it's me trying to have two different paths from a safety point of view of uh, getting this project done. Uh, either way will work out for us if we go an IPO or if we ended up with a strategic, our shareholders and our work would, would benefit. And, and by the way, let me make it clear here that all the work that we're doing 
is a result of work of several different teams, particularly the team that I have right now doing Medical 21, which my, my wife, Elizabeth, uh, said, it's the best team you've ever had, Manny. And I agree. Uh, they're a young group, dedicated to their work, willing to take the risk. And I can't emphasize that enough. When you're doing these projects, baby, you are taking risk. And if you're not ready to take risk, go home, okay? Because we are going to take a lot of risk, okay? Remember, the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. He or she that risks nothing does nothing and most of the time is nothing. And so that's why we really have a great team. They're willing to take a risk. And, and by the same stroke, if this thing works, I told one of my guys, you can go fishing every day of the year, <laughs> okay? And he's, he's a great fisherman, loves to go fishing. And I said, we get this done, you go fishing. Yeah. That's great. Anyway, we're having a wonderful time. And let me also add to that, that it, besides the team, I have a wife and family that have supported me. Elizabeth is always, you know, hanging in there with me. There are moments when the risk is so high that, it's, that you know, you kind of it almost hurts the risk, uh, the pain and all that. But she hangs in there. I gotta love her for that, and I appreciate that. You know, Manny, I uh, one of the things you've shared with me separately, privately, on a couple occasions is that you know that you you ha you have and you live the best life, and how much you love your family. And it's a it's a privilege to always be with you, but especially to be able to experience all this stuff with you and your amazing wife and on this trip in particular, one of your two amazing daughters. And uh, uh, you're just, again, you're an incredible asset to our industry and uh, we're grateful for the, all, all that you've done for us. And we're, we know that you're gonna have a bunch of success. You're gonna have a tremendous su success with Medical 21. Grateful that you choose LSI to come and find those investors and meet those strategics and share your story. And so hopefully we'll continue seeing you back. And uh, until then, we'll keep plugging away. We'll uh, keep chasing those investors. And All right, Manny. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. All right. Thank you, as All always. Right. Always.